kind of feels like the earth just sent us all to our rooms to think about what we've done. Before coronavirus, you you know my position that everybody kind of knows what they have to do. 7% reduction in emissions year on year on year. We've got 20 years to get these down to blah, blah, blah. There wasn't a snowball's chance in hell of that ever happening. And it didn't matter how many cops we had. Let's, let's grow our potatoes in the back garden. Let's start, you know, if you need a car, well, you know, we can car share. I mean, all of a sudden, it's different. Like right now, you can feel the difference. People are helping one another. That old person over there, can they get to the supermarket? Let's just give them a call and see. And suddenly, it's different. Every evening here at eight o'clock, we open the windows in the evening and we clap our hands raw for the medical staff and for the people who are trying to make keep things going. So, we we were asked, uh, you know, in, in 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 a broad context to reflect on what we can do. And I have very specific work that I do within the commission, uh, and and you know, I was able to give my inputs on those things. But as somebody with a with an obligation, a right, a duty to 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 use my capacities to think about um, the big picture issues, it struck me that what I needed to also do, uh, particularly in the context of our foresight work, was to raise the big issues. So I guess um, I guess what I've raised here are these big issues. Yeah. As as we look towards piecemeal. Uh, survival day in day out that's good but we also need to begin to feel the really profound change so what I ever said have suggested to, to the groups that I work with is that we begin a reflection inter DG foresight climate change groups all the all the kind of um, ideas stuff that's going on uh, in the EU at the moment we begin a reflection on the end of normal. And, and I made a couple of very rapid points. I said, one, the COVID crisis might not, in fact, probably will not end, at least on a century's time scale. COVID two, three, and so on and so forth will come along, forcing humans to reestablish a more normal place in the interconnected web of life. Or we might qu quite possibly go extinct. There's no short-term cure for this. Mm -hmm. This evolution is no longer even nominally under human control. That's the big revelation to me as I sit here in isolation. Accelerating incidences of novel SARS-type viruses and our inability to exercise control will lead inevitably to a shrinking and more localized world. International travel, just as one example, will remain very risky for generations globalized trade and goods the same. Localization will be the emerging new normal. Again, force of circumstances. And the regeneration of natural biodiverse barriers between humankind and our so-called viral enemies will also occur naturally as we retreat in number and physical disbursement. I would suggest a new dietary regime is utterly inevitable. I would suggest that as the only, at least for decades to come, defense that there is against our niche competitor slash parasite, this particular virus and other viruses, the only real way to, to combat this virus is for people to be extraordinarily healthy. The only way for people to be extraordinarily healthy is to stop the ridiculous, you know, animal products based diet that has been one of the primary contributors to the destruction of our planet to date. Heavy, so, heavy meat consumption, heavy sugar consumption, heavy processed food. Dairy, fish, all that kind of stuff. Human beings are, you know, are, are, should be eating a plant-based whole food diet largely composed of starches. Dr. Neil Bernard, uh, the, the famous China study and so on and so forth. We've known this for centuries but it might actually happen this time because there's no stopping getting the virus but you know if your resistance and your immunity is strong you might not get it but if you get it and you have strong resistance and immunity you have a better chance of survival yeah. and we're probably all pretty much going to get it or its first cousin or its yeah. son or daughter within the next few years so 
human beings who do not eat these carcinogenic, uh, uh, debilitating um, uh, diets don't have underlying issues, manage to survive. So, so I think it's something that's going to happen. You don't need to make veganism popular anymore. People just don't want to die in hospitals. Yeah. I would suggest as well that money and debt economic models are already clearly obsolete. I mean, how many times do you bail out banks and massive big uh, companies? I mean, they're clearly obsolete. I go further, I would suggest that they will be utterly incomprehensible to most people within 10 to 15 years. People will wonder what this thing called an economy was. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite questions to people at the moment is what's an economy? Like, what is an economy? Will somebody tell me what an economy is? I said, the new mechanism for ensuring we produce what we need and want is emerging. I don't understand how it's emerging, but it's all around me at the moment. Mm -hmm. Big parts of it are the smiles and, 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 and knowing looks of my neighbors and people as we get up half an hour outdoors, walking dogs or whatever. Although the I would like I to- um, Before you go on, the one I love is the, the video I was sent of Pedrito yeah. playing uh, the theme of the Titanic movie on his balcony and all mm. the other balconies around him in Barcelona were either mm. playing on instruments or singing or... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, this is this is very fundamental re-engineering. I mean, you, 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 spoke, you spoke earlier of, um, of money and, you know, and I, I love, for me, one of the great philosophers of the 20th century was a man called Alan Watts, who I'm sure you know well. Yeah. And, um, but Alan has a wonderful piece where he talks about, you know, money, the confusion between money and wealth. You know, like wealth is having stuff, doing stuff. Um, uh, uh, money is, is something that, that we use that kind of can approximate to or can in some circumstances facilitate. But he makes this wonderful joke where he suggests that human beings can't go on without the money-based economy is roughly the equivalent of sort of the head of a building site sending his workers home one day because he's run out of inches or run out of centimeters. Sorry, we have no more inches today. We can't carry on building. What? <laughs> it's it's a metric. It's an entirely artificial human construct that has had its uses. But what follows? What follows is the big question. Let me go back to the uh, yeah. to the email. Okay, so the yep. new mechanism for ensuring we produce what we need and want is emerging. Go on. Mm -hmm. I, I, again, this has me just been a smart ass. Um, I mean, it's emerging on its own, uh, though it should also provide fruitful ground for speculation for the many redundant economists who will be available for consultation <laughs> once their labors in the fields are finished to the satisfaction of those who oversee them. I just want to see every economist in the world with a shovel in his hand digging potatoes, you know, or, or scooping up horse poop to put on the carrots, you know. I mean, talking, uh, talking about something real and not about this <laughs> hypothetical invisible hand of the marketplace. Here in Brussels, where I am now, that whoa, the crazy stuff is beginning to fade away. It's beginning to seem ghostly. Um, what's real is standing on the balcony and clapping for those workers. What's also real is very unpleasant people, for example, throwing healthcare workers out of the co location arrangements because they're scared they're going to bring the virus. So, so. But, but by and large, as somebody has written recently, it's not like the horror movies. People haven't turned into zombies and aren't kind of drilling through people's brains to suck their juices out. You know, it <laughs> seems like people are, people are kind of feeling the pulse of their connectedness, not only to one another, but to what is, mm. say, invisible hands and econometric theory. And, oh, actually, I'd just like some nice food to eat. I'd like the heat to stay on and I'd like to be looked after. Yeah. Is that okay? Really? So aside from all of these redundant uh, neoclassical economists, <laughs> ecological economists will not be redundant. They will be needed. But that's my view. Um, okay, so then you say in F, we will be making no more German cars, nor Japanese cars, nor... Right. Well, again, I, I, it's, you know, again it's, it's the example that we, we spoke about earlier. Like, like we knew we had this seriously wrong. Well, one of my favorite things is looking at the statistics on um, on, on things like cars. I'd say, uh, I, I, I like to give the Germans a hard time. I'd like to give the Irish and the French a hard time about, you know, slaughtering, you know, tortured animals at the end of their miserable lives as well. But cars I love at the moment because in most wealthy European countries, we now have 1.5 cars per family. I mean, 
how many more of these things do we need to make? <laughs> the place is pretty small. Um, one of the things you notice now is nobody's using the cars. It's, it's kind of nice. Now, somebody said, no, we have to get the economy back on track. We have to get growth going again so that we can afford to, afford to what? Afford to tackle the coronavirus. But no, we have to do exactly the opposite. Somehow the earth has to rebalance, which probably means that we'll just be forced so far back into our little, our little clearings in the forest or our little cities that the earth will naturally retake at least nine tenths of what we took from it. Mm -hmm. And then we have a chance because, I mean, all the earth is really doing is what any large uh, complex living system does. It's it's defending itself. It's getting a temperature. It's doing some pretty weird stuff, and it's killing lots of stuff. And it hopes it gets out the far end. That's what your body does as well. Um, so the Earth is just kind. Of, the Earth would rather get back to the way it was. Like something that's in dynamic equilibrium doesn't necessarily want to jump to a new state. It will if it has to. That will happen. But Curiously, the opportunity presented here is for it to actually restabilize in a in, in an to a climatic and uh, and ecosystem stability that still has a niche for humans. How cool Hopefully. would that be? Because, as I say, before coronavirus, you you know my position that. Everybody kind of knows what they have to do. 7% reduction in emissions year on year on year. We've got 20 years to get these down to blah, blah, blah. There wasn't a snowball's chance in hell of that ever happening. And it didn't matter how many cops we had. Cops on the beat, cops in Glasgow, cops in Madrid. It didn't matter. It was never going to happen. Bizarrely, the universe seems to be making it happen. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't like this. Um... It, it, you know, the 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 toll of deaths uh, ticking up, uh, you know, on the local news. It's heartbreaking. It is horrendous. It is, but but there is no doubt that what was needed to be done, we would never have done. Yeah, ever. I, what you what we were just saying kind of made me remember uh, yeah. the image of the money, uh, the monkey trap where yeah. they put nuts in a bottle and the monkey goes in and grabs the nuts and then doesn't have the intelligence to let the nuts and escape. Open, just can't open its fist. Just can't open its fist. Yeah, but, yeah. but in ways, it, and I, if we get through this, in a bizarre way, I think it will mean we are profoundly changed yeah. because it wasn't us. Whatever our notion of, you know, anthropomorphic gods and so on and so forth, it will have to be different. Yeah, I'm very, as I say, I, I, something I'd love you to share is uh, yeah, John McDougall, Dr. John McDougall's wonderful video made about the 15th of March, you know, on, on how people need to prepare and get ready for the, um, you know, health-wise and what they need to store and how they need to eat um, uh, uh, for the crisis. And one of the things, you know, he even has the courage to bring up um, Speci uh, 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 speciesism, you know, the, the, the bias against species. Like, who exactly do we think are, we are? Even, even, even our most progressive and intelligent people refer to the virus as the enemy. Who's not? It's a cohabitant on this planet. Yeah. The vast majority of systems, living systems on this planet, operate through what's technically called um, um, uh, mutualism uh, um, so we we understand evolution as being something that's always red in tooth and claw you know there's, there's predation and there's um uh, and there's parasitism everybody knows about those two but the vast majority of things in the natural world work according to um, collaborative mutualism mm -hmm. they work together the vast majority of cells in my body don't even have my DNA. My mm -hmm. microbiome, there's far more things in here that don't have my, beyond, don't have my DNA than, than does have my DNA. So what exactly am I? I co-evolved with this earth. You know, so again, it's, it's an aspect, I often think we should have called ourselves kind of, rather than wise men, handy men. 
because we're really good at making stuff. And to make stuff, you kind of reduce the problem to a very specific thing. And even science is like this. The si you know, what is it in this particular plant that makes it good for you? And then we get the extracts and we take it in droplets. But of course, that's completely the wrong question. You, you evolved with those plants. They evolved with you. Science might be able to give you an interesting insight into, isn't that interesting that it does it this way, that you know, this, we think this is the active ingredient. But we will never know more by aggregating all the individual pieces of knowledge than we do by simply apprehending the whole as it is. And the whole as it is, is we're part of this. And it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And now the part is taking us by the hand. We're going to be punished severely. But for the first time since we have spoken, I have the glimmer of a hope that our species might still be around in 20 years. Mm. That's, that's, that is, uh, that's that is... new for me, as you know. Yeah. That, that... Sorry, it's called obligative mutualism. The, the, well, when I was speaking about predation, parasitism, and mutualism, it's obligative mutualism, which is the one nobody has heard of, and it's what all of nature does. It collaborates. Obligative mutualism. Obligative mutualism. That Love. is the primary mechanism of all Darwinian fitting and evolution. Obligative mutualism. You find your little niche and you collaborate. Mm. You're part of the whole. As I say, we also identify parasitism and predation. And those are the ones we think this is the way nature works. Nonsense. Mm. Like I say, I personally think of myself as a meat uber. You know, I carry around all these wonderful little microbiomes who need me. That's it. That's, mm -hmm. that's part of my job in life is to keep these feed guys it. going. Your that's job cool. is to feed the biome that lives in your gut. That's it. I mean, but I'm, not, I'm only kind of half joking. I'm in no way superior to these things. The mitochondria yeah. were a foreign being to the, the, the single cell that they they got into Brilliant. this ligative yep. mutualism with, where if you yep. take me inside of your cellular body, I will feed Love you it. energy if you will feed me. There it now, is. Now, now that's, that's kind of, and, and somehow we managed to reduce everything to the selfish gene and individuals out for their own outlook. I mean, you even stand in awe of the, I mean, I, I look at the medical people here, or the guys driving the buses, or, or the girls at the supermarket checkout, and they are mostly girls to be fair. Like they're turning up for work. They're seeing people going past every day who could have the virus. They're turning up for, you know, the lowest paid jobs. Can somebody tell, right now, that girl in that supermarket who ser serves me every second day when I go in to get my greens and whatever and so on and so forth, she is a lot more valuable doing her job to me than any Nobel Prize winning economist yes. or, you know, or, or fantasist of invisible hands or Yeah, or, or even, she, yeah. yeah. I, I'm just thinking how our, our society has it so backwards where we pay yeah. our farmers and our teachers and are the people who deliver yeah. the goods and services we need to survive yeah. are the lowest paid. And the people yeah. who, who figure out how to sell us more mm. crap are the highest paid. <laughs> Just, I, I, I love that. I was going to finish my story about the German car manufacturers. What I love about them, yeah. I, I'm being mean to Germans. I mean, it's everybody, obviously. But, um, you know, it's, uh, how do we get more cars sold? Okay, we can move into China. And then they have this wonderful... Um, we can lie wonderful... about our emissions. <laughs> you can't say that. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, but I mean, it's the same. I mean, you, you talk to Irish nutritionalists. They're all educated in Ireland. Oh, meat and dairy have a hugely important part on the, you know, on the nutrition pyramid. Well, yeah, if you want to die of cancer or cardiovascular problems mm -hmm. or cancer, they do. But if you'd like to live a healthy life and not see a doctor till you're 60 or 70, I mean, maybe you should eat what human beings were designed to eat. But so, so I mean, it's not, you know, yes, I mean, the, the emissions cheating scandal was a fabulous piece of dishonesty. But this dishonesty is everywhere. And, and this is currently what we were incapable of escaping from. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, we, we didn't even escape from it. It just kind of disappeared. COVID just took it away from us and it's not going to give it back to us. 
yeah. which is again short term thinking and that's okay people turn to me and say well john you must be happy you know uh, well, all the emissions have gone down what's happening currently in terms of the climate is the single biggest terror i would say that any uh, independent climate scientist could have had uh, aside from when the um, when the arctic ice goes and that'll go this year the so blue ocean event the blue ocean event will almost certainly occur this year and that's that's going to that's the challenges this will lead to you know not 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 immediately but in, in the coming years you're, you're looking at easy and extra degrees temperature but the other thing that's usually frightening is the aerosol masking effect so few enough people know that what, what one of the great benefits of burning coal coal in particular is that not only does it send out loads of CO2 which warms up the atmosphere, but at the same time it sends out loads of particulate waste, which keeps the atmosphere cool. It's like a little parasol, thousands and countless billions of little parasols which reflect the sunlight. Um, we know from 9-11, I'm talking about the second one, um, when the, um, uh, not Pinochet, I'm talking about the one in New York, not 1973 Pinochet. But when 9-11 happened and those aircraft were grounded over the United States, what we saw was um, a plus six and a plus 0.6 and a minus 0.5 swing in temperatures within three days, just from the just from the contrails. Now, uh, it's it's difficult to know whether contrails are are particular waste from fossil fuel burning and in particular you know dirty coal, mm -hmm. uh, which is the bigger effect. But all the recent papers seem to indicate that we lose thirty to forty percent only that of particulates in the air suddenly, and this will lead very very quickly, almost instantaneously, to one degree jump in temperature. Yes. Just bang. Now. So this terrifies me at the moment because even though China might be getting back on track and you know they do a lot of the manufacturing, everywhere else is closing down. So bizarrely enough, um, uh, although obviously a climate obsessive, the last thing that I would be shutting down would be dirty coal plants. You know, you stop the cars first, you stop the petrol first, you stop the diesel, you stop the methane, the natural, everything else, and then slowly start getting rid of you know that particulate waste, which is essentially geoengineering us to a degree cooler than it would otherwise be, mm -hmm. as well as, and the problem with that is losing it instantaneously you get the heating effect almost instantaneously. Putting it up there, the full effect of, of CO2 emissions tends to take about 10 years. So, so, so in fact, this sudden drop in, of all things, dirty coal terrifies me. Europe was within 20, um, 20 percentage points relative humidity and one degree of having a wet bulb event. Sorry, Brussels, as, as I said in Geneva a couple of years ago, whenever it was, Two summers ago, we hit 41 with 40% relative humidity. I, I think you have that, that, that particular slide that I show all the time. It is very likely, therefore, that this summer, given that we'll have far less Arctic ice, we look definitely to have an El, El Nino and you know, this particular issue. It is very likely that even as far north as Brussels, we're going to have wet bulb events, maybe for days. Now that will be tens of thousands of people dying in the streets, particularly the elderly and the infirm, because we don't have the air conditioned facilities here. So one of the things I'm interested in doing is getting people to please, can we identify where there's air conditioned facilities for late July, late August, so we can get people into these facilities, which doesn't really work too well with social isolation. Let, let me clarify what you mean by wet bulb uh, for, for people yeah. in the audience watching this who don't understand. You send me a one, sent me a wonderful graphic called the heat stress index chart. You've got Fahrenheit and centigrade temperatures down the left-hand column. And if we focus, say, on 90 degrees Fahrenheit, equivalent to a little bit over 32 centigrade, well, if your relative humidity is 25 or 30 percent, perhaps light showers, then you're in an area on the, char the chart called mild stress. But if you move over just a little bit to 35% humidity, then you're in the area of severe stress. Let's move down to 100 degree Fahrenheit day, about 38 degrees C. 
And if you move over to 55% humidity, then you're in the area of very severe stress. And one more move, if you move down to 105 degree day, which is getting more common, a bit over 40 degrees centigrade, then you move into an area where they say you have dead cattle. Well, what about people out in the street? So at a very, at a curiously low temperature, so your core temperature is in around 37. And the way your body keeps that cool is that your exterior is at about 36. So it can transfer, so the core protecting the organs can transfer heat to the exterior. And the way the exterior gets rid of it is it lets it evaporate in terms of sweat into the air. But if that air, even at only 36 degrees, and I'm not sure what that is in, 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 in weird American stuff, um, mm -hmm. but even at that 36 degrees, where the 100% relative humidity in the air, evaporation can't occur. What happens is the water just comes out and falls onto the ground. It takes no heat from the core. Yeah, the sweat, you just drip sweat. You, you just, it just falls off you, but there's no cooling possible. It doesn't evaporate. And in the same way, if it's 40 degrees, you only need it to be about 60 or 70% relative humidity. And at that stage, you're cooking. Your internal organs cook. The fittest person in the world has six hours in those conditions. Yeah, so all those uh, uh, allusions to mm. the frog in the pot are quite uh, quite relevant. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, and, and again, it's a sort of a thing that, and this is a sort of thing that's that's interesting me now. You know, my admiration for you know the guys and girls in the checkout in the supermarket. The um, the nurses going into work in spite of the fact that maybe they're um, the colocataire, uh, you know, are, are scared to let them into the into the apartment. Mm. What it is we need to be doing in Brussels now so that the old people's homes are not scenes of the most dreadful death and carnage come late July, August, if we hit wet bulb, which we will certainly hit in certain areas of Europe, but could easily, easily, probably will hit in Northern Europe as well. So, so suddenly you're faced with these very practical, real problems. Yeah. And, and that's okay. Can, can we do something about this? Is there somebody I can help? What can I do? Rather than worrying about how, I don't know, some strange new economic model is going to solve this. No. Am I getting the latest iPhone or something like that? <laughs> German car, German car. I need a German car and, and I an like, Irish steak. I like to take my shot at Apple because I still have an iPhone 3. That oh, well done. Except yeah. that yeah. they have managed to obsolete it by forcing all of the apps to new, you know, new operating <laughs> system. And, but it still works, works well. And it's, I think... The nice Actually, the Apple one is one of my favorite examples of why, um, of why I think we would never have been capable of saving ourselves and why, you know, our chances now brought about by this coronavirus because one i remember writing a report years ago with a good friend colin joyce and it was called consumer 2020 and we had this sudden revelation wow you know going forward yeah we wrote i think we wrote this in 2010 and i can't remember i think it was 2010 maybe a bit earlier but smart like phones and smart stuff was out and we suddenly realized wow you know we can really reduce the material intensity of the economy because i mean like a phone now it's just it's just a little thing that looks like a skinny brick right so all you need to do is update the software i mean you don't need to use the material anymore that is so brilliant did it make a damn bit of difference? No. Nope. People go and buy the latest iPhone. I can't tell one iPhone from the other. But the Apple Acolytes, oh man, that's a you know a 9C or a 10B or a, what? How do you know this shit? It's a little square of plastic. You know, so so the notion that humans would have been in any way capable of sort of saying, wow, man, sorry, I'll I will show mine. Wow, man, look, I bought this 20 years ago and I just keep upgrading the software and it's perfect. It's going to love it. I mean, it's ridiculous. The same with your washing machine, the same with your, the same with your car, the same with anything. Of course, we could simply software update most of this stuff. Even if we didn't use software, good old Cubans managed to keep those 1940s and 50s cars going till oh, about yeah. today, I think. Oh. The, same, the same people who are sending doctors all over the world to help out. Yeah. There's got to be, there's another way of doing this when you don't have a choice.
Well, the I, mean, I guess, I guess, I guess Kennedy was Cuba's coronavirus <laughs> in a kind of a curious way, and it's never gone away. It's never gone away, and it never will go away. And maybe that's okay. Are the Cubans so, so badly off? Rather be in Cuba than New York at the moment. If we return to a, 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 a regime of fixing rather than throwing away, repairing. Yep. So it's not just reduce, reuse, recycle, oh, yeah. but it's repair, repurpose. I once yes. went to the exercise of thinking of all of the re-words <laughs> that fit yeah. with that, and I came up with a page full of them. Fantastic, fantastic. And I mean, isn't that a wonderful vision of an economy as well? An economy. Isn't that a wonderful vision of people working together? I mean, we've built all this shit. Okay, we can keep it. Lots of it, maybe. Let's keep it going. Let's let's grow our potatoes in the back garden. Let's start, you know, if you need a car, well, you know, we can car share. I mean, all of a sudden, it's different. Like right now, you can feel the difference. People are helping one another. That old person over there, can they get to the supermarket? Let's just give them a call and see. And suddenly it's different. And, and, and we know that this is possible because we've seen experiments in alternative currencies in places like Japan and so on and so on. And you just, it's different. Let, let me add just a couple of items and then we're gonna have to yep. close unfortunately. But yep. one yep. of them is a, uh, a quote that I wish I could remember where I got it. I didn't originate it, I wish I had. Scarcity of words leads to potency of words. Nice. Less is more. Um, the other thing is one that I have at the signature file of my emails going out now, which was kind of feels like the earth just sent us all to our rooms to think about what we've done. <laughs> I, I love that one. That is beautiful. And you know, I think that's fantastic. I mean, and again, acknowledging the privileged position I'm in and how the stress that some people must be under. And I say, if this goes on a while longer, I don't for one minute imagine that, you know, the citizens of Europe are going to continue paying me this wonderful salary and let me sit here, you know, do, yeah. doing what I'm doing with you. I mean, it'll change. So I'm not going to be comfortable forever either. But the silence there's so many people admitting to wow it's mm. okay the silence mm. you wake up in the morning what do i do got a lot of work to do yeah got some stuff to do with Stuart. that's nice too but a lot of the time you know it's you know learning how to live with one another again like this tomorrow when my daughter gets home from um, from honduras there'll be six of us again in the house and two dogs you know and uh, Mm -hmm. Wow, I mean, how do you co? Wow, this is all so different. It's, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. all, it's all beautiful. And one of the things, and just to just to even take one more piece out, they say they say that the the student learns something every day, and the master forgets something. So just mm -hmm. to just to take one more piece out of your beautiful thing about the, the 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 efficiency of words when used sparingly, Rumi, um, mm -hmm. that wonderful. Um, um, oh, uh, Sophie Poet, he famously said that silence is closest to God. All else is poor translation. 